lost Concordia. Yeah, Minister, your, your performance uh, on, on this issue has been uh, you know, appalling, very, very disappointing. Uh, you, you clearly are a party to what will happen uh, to public transport in the future because you are the Minister for Transport. You're actually the Minister for Transport. You seem to have forgotten that simple fact and you've been, you've been prepared to allow 100,000 people to wait uh, morning after morning for this strike to be resolved, 2,600 workers uh, to have their pay and conditions slashed by 30 per cent or more with threats to hundreds of jobs and you've sat there doing nothing, like a hurler on the ditch, like, like a journalist observing things rather than taking action. You are a party to this uh, because there's no question public transport is a public good. Uh, we have to provide uh, funding and subventions as indeed every other European country does of up to perhaps 70 per cent, 80 per cent, 90 per cent. Uh, yet you, are, you have slashed the subvention and, and you haven't been prepared uh, to come forward and take your role. I welcome the WRC move. Uh, you should have appointed an intermediary months ago and to got this resolved before there were any cuts. Thanks, I thank you, Duskin Kurgan. Uh, Minister, it's extraordinary how you've managed to sit back for 12 days. Uh, and I agree with Deputy Munster. It was even more extraordinary how quickly you found the Morning Ireland studio last Friday when the commuters in Dublin South were suddenly affected. You have questions to answer in relation to the National Transport Authority. The reason bus earners are in their space they are is because of the damage that's being done to Expressway, because they, fight, they have to do their business on a very different pitch from other, from other operators. You have a piece as a member of Cabinet in relation to the sector and employment order to bring decency and fairness for everybody who drives a bus and works in a bus company. You, this is the call of the all. You should answer for that. Minister, you also have a responsibility as a member of Cabinet to the regional towns and the regional cities who are absolutely decimated by this action. This is not the fault of the 2,000 workers. This is the fault of bus air management who have driven them to that and the fault of you, Minister, as the principal shareholder who are fiddling. You are there fiddling away to yourself, laughing away to yourself, while 2,000 families and hundreds of thousands of people working in regional economies are suffering. Wake up, Minister. Um, Minister, I am really shocked when I read that your billionaire buddy uh, from Ryanair thinks you're playing a stormer. I just want to remind you that this man caused a lockout in Dublin Airport in the mid-90s uh, because he refused to recognise trade unions. And it's extraordinary to see you all on the one side of the pitch fighting ordinary working class people. And indeed, uh, what they're saying about you, Minister, in, in the, in, on the picket line is that you are literally stepping aside, which is what you are passionately uh, there to defend, which is step aside. So I just want to say that what happened last Friday may have shook you to your, uh, to your toes to get on Morning Ireland with a, a sort of a, an impulsive reaction to condemn these people who are here today to witness what you have to say about them. We think that what they did last Friday was very important because otherwise you, this government and the company are totally ignoring what in reality is happening for the last 13 days. Shut down the capital and you all wake up and smell the coffee. Carmichael. And Ted Chakdella and Chakda by Barrett. Minister, can I first of all I pay tribute to the determination and the resolve of the 2,400 bus workers who have 12 days now uh, spent on the picket line defending themselves against unilateral and savage cuts to their pay and to the whole public transport uh, system. Now, in your attempt to justify uh, your absence from the pitch and your failure to intervene, uh, on this matter. You have repeated endlessly the mantra that you don't have a checkbook to bring to solve this dispute. Now, can I make a very simple proposal, Minister? Uh, it was revealed over the weekend that Transport Infrastructure Ireland has €100 million Euro that it didn't expect in a refund back from revenue. €100 million. Euro. It would cost seven to nine million to solve this dispute. That money is going a begging. Uh, there's no, it's not earmarked for anything, and it's under your remit, and nothing would be more appropriate than money from Transport Infrastructure Ireland, I repeat, was used to resolve the bus air and dispute and to ensure these workers Mega. don't have to accept savage pay uh, cuts and cuts Deputy to public Kenny. services. So will you Deputy use that money, Kenny. simple question, to resolve this dispute Deputy so Kenny. these workers can go back to work uh, on fair pay and conditions? Deputy Kenny, one minute. Thanks. Let's go on, Carla. I'd like to comment on um, two uh, comments that were made over the weekend, one by Michael O'Leary 
uh, the enemy of the working class in this country, and the Social Protection Minister, Leah Varadkar. And basically, Leah Varadkar said that this company should fold. And I think that's the kind of the ideology of this government. Um, then Michael Leary well, uh, goes on and uh, he says he praises you for not intervening. Now, this man is the prince of darkness to me. Uh, this man is the enemy of the working class. And what the, what the ideology of this government is to do is to privatise a public service. We go on this house about the rural Ireland and its decline. Because um, you, uh, this is a, such a good public service in rural Ireland, you're taking that away. And that's, to me, that's more detrimental than anything in the world. So, look, at, you know, you have to c c come forward and resolve this strike. Carmichael Hacke and Jack Tate, don't hold it. There's a, there's a bit of a dichotomy, uh, Minister, in the media between rural Ireland and urban Ireland that misses entirely the fact that this dispute has brought Ireland's second biggest city and many of the other major cities to a complete standstill. Cork has been brought practically to a standstill uh, by this strike. The Cork Business Association estimates that uh, footfall in the city has fallen between 30 and 50 per cent. Now that simply would not be allowed to happen in Dublin and your response and the response of many other government representatives uh, on the day of the uh, actions in Dublin bus reflect that. Uh, this is happening on your watch, Minister. It is not the responsibility or the fault of those workers who are rightly rejecting savage pay cuts of potentially up to 30 per cent. No worker could accept or tolerate cuts of that level. This is happening on your watch. I put it to you in the Transport Committee the last day. There is no good reason not to intervene. This is one of the most important pieces of strategic infrastructure in the state, Remind delivering you. people to school, education, work, hospitals, and, and you are simply allowing it to, to fall you. idle. This is your responsibility, Minister. Jack Billy uh, thanks, I'll ask you, Corla. Just to say at the outset, Minister, uh, you're talking about uh, calling people to open their minds to trying to find a solution. But I think you are predisposed ideologically to not find a solution, to not allow the workers and others to come together in a meaningful forum that would at least address the underlying problems uh, facing Bus Aaron. And we all know what they are. We can't resolve, or you can't expect, the problems in the company to be resolved on the shoulders of the bus drivers and workers in general. There has to be a strategic plan put in place with regard to bus Aaron and, and, and its obligations that it serves across the whole country. So, Minister, you must become the relevant minister. You have been irrelevant for a long time on this particular issue, and now you must step up to the plate. And, you know, at the end of the day, you have shown previously that you're able to get involved in cronyism and pork barrel politics by opening up step aside Garda station. And on a fundamental issue of national interest, you take no interest. Minister, please bring everybody together and ensure there's a viability plan. That doesn't mean that every worker has to take massive pay cuts uh, to fund the restructuring that's required Michael, in the company. And finally in charge, uh, Michael McGrath. Thanks, uh, let's get uh, Minister, you're characterising this dispute as being just like any other industrial dispute, that it's all about the terms and conditions of workers, and why don't the two sides just get together, talk it out, and negotiate a settlement? I mean, as you know, this dispute uh, is far more complex than that. And the message you are sending out to the workers is that they are going to have to carry the entire burden of this deficit. That's not a sustainable or tenable position, Minister. You need to send a signal, and you need to send a signal that you are prepared to engage yourself in meaningful talks on a parallel basis with the key stakeholders, the company, the NTA, the Department of Social Protection uh, in respect of the free travel scheme, and your department needs to be at the heart of that. There is a need for a proper, sustainable plan for Bus Aaron. We haven't got one. You can't expect the entirety of that burden to be carried by the workers. So deal with that. Face up to your responsibilities, Minister. The impact on Cork City and the suburbs around Cork City has been extremely serious uh, for the traders, for the passengers, and not least, of course, for the workers who are now 12 days without pay. Please deal with it. I'd like to uh, first of all thank all the deputies for their very constructive responses. <clears throat> I welcome this afternoon's announcement that both parties have accepted an invitation from the WRC to recommence discussions. I hope that both parties can use this opportunity to agree upon an acceptable and fair deal. 
The travelling public, in particular, will expect that the parties can come to an agreement that allows for an end to this recent period of disrup disruption to transport services. The core of this dispute relates to how Bus Aaron organises itself and how it uses its people and resources to deliver the services it provides. Both management and unions agree that there are inefficiencies in that organisation and use of people and resources and both sides agree that there are improvements possible. And that's the basis for agreement. Those issues are fundamental to resolving this dispute. Most importantly, those issues can only be resolved by those parties with real insight into the impact those issues have on the company and its finances. Those parties are, of course, the management and the unions. I don't assume that these reconvened discussions will be easy for either party. There will be a need for flexibility and compromise, but in the end, this dispute will only be resolved through those discussions and nowhere else. Of course, I'm aware of the calls of some for ministerial intervention. Interestingly, I've heard trade union representatives make it clear they see no role for a minister in industrial relations negotiations. I suggest that the House might be better served by heeding that insight. I have intervened where I believe it to be appropriate for me as a minister to intervene. I have intervened to secure increased funding for those socially ne necessary but financially unviable PSO services. Bus Aaron has benefited from that increase last year and will benefit again this year. I have intervened to publicly state my commitment to further increasing that PSO allocation in future budgets as resources allow. I have intervened to ensure that the funding arrangements in relation to the free travel scheme are examined to make sure that equity and transparency across commercial licensed bus operators. That examination is almost complete, and I have stated the issue will be, be, be resolved satisfactorily. I have assured Rural Island the NTA has powers and resources required to ensure transport connectivity is maintained when commercial bus services are altered. That assurance has taken a tangible form in the NTA's response to recent re expressway changes with increased PSO services and amended rural transport services being provided. I have stated that I am willing to consider any amendments to the commercial bus licen licensing system that my department right might recommend, and indeed I have shared a copy of an NTA report on the licensing system with the Joint Directors Com Committee and invited them to make their own submission. I have also confirmed my, my willingness to meet with all stakeholders on transport policy issues, but quite reasonably have also stated those meetings cannot take place against a backdrop, backdrop of industrial action or the threat of such, such, such action. So to say there has been no inter ministerial intervention, intervention is quite simply wrong. But let me reiterate what has been my position from the start. I will not intervene in areas where it is not appropriate for a minister to intervene. I will not dictate to management and, and unions an agreement that only they can craft because it relates to issues that only they have an insight into. The WRC and the Labour Court are ready and able to assist both parties in coming to that agreement. Will I want House, to see a... Sorry, Minister. I, can I just You'll finish just this? You just have to tailor your, your contribution. Okay. Will the House agree an extra minute? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Agreed. Thank you. Thank you. I'd like to thank the House for that. I want to see a public transport system that delivers for all of society, a system that provides the infrastructure and services that the 21st century island demands and requires. I genuinely believe that Bus Aaron has a role to play in that system, and I have no wish to privatise it, as has been alleged in many quarters many times. I believe the company can continue to serve rural Ireland and our regional cities. But in order to do that, there's a need for discussions and agreement between management and unions. The WRC is the correct forum for those discussions, and I again welcome the fact that both parties have this afternoon accepted an invitation to recommence, their, to recommence their discussions in the WRC. I know that both sides, and all members of this House, of course, want to see this situation resolved. And I am sure that the state's industrial relations bodies can help to deliver that resolution. Now, there's another round, and uh, I start with Deputy Coppinger. One minute. 
uh, ranting and raving and some people were fooled by the label independent and they actually thought that you were independent but of course this is a wish fulfillment for you because uh, Michael O'Leary says you're playing a blinder and you have an ideological opposition to public services and trade unions and so has obviously Mr Bradker. Now last Friday workers showed solidarity to each other across the three companies. People say why wasn't it announced in advance? Well because years of anti-union laws have made such solidarity illegal. The kind of solidarity that founded unions in the first place, that Connolly, Larkin, the people who fought in 1913 in this city, uh, forged. So I think solidarity action across the three companies is going to be essential to win this dispute. I applaud the workers for respecting that and, and knowing that. And uh, we have to fight now this Industrial Relations Act in order to bring workers' power Where back in this country again. And check the McBarry, one minute. Minister, there is rage at you in the country outside of Dublin. In Cork, Galway, Limerick, Waterford and smaller towns right across the country. Among stranded passengers, stranded elderly passengers, workers paying taxi fares now to get to work, businesses that have been hit very hard. In an unpopular government with unpopular ministers, you are the most unpopular of them all. And those angry people are not going to tolerate another round the Mulberry, Mulberry Bush uh, 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 episode at the Workplace Relations Commission that does not show a, f a, a way forward. And the way forward can only be shown is if you say there's going to be an increased subvention for proper public transport service and Mr Varadkar says we're going to properly compensate Bus Aaron for its free travel pass uh, work. Otherwise, it's about a low-pay agenda, a race to the bottom agenda, a privatisation agenda. And there's no way that people are going to continue suffering in silence uh, while you pursue an agenda of this kind. The message from, from those people and from the workers right around the country and in Dublin is this. Resolve this dispute. Fund public transport. In fact, uh, Kevin O'Keefe. Minister, thank you for your response. I just quote from a committee meeting in the 23rd of, uh, 23rd of 22nd of uh, February. I can't give an undertaking that the same level of service will, will be given on those routes. That's the, the quote from Ms. Anne Graham, CEO of the NTA. Minister, the NTA has a major role to play in this dispute, and dispute should never come about if the NTA had been more considerate. The NTA have, Minister, the forfeit the grant licences, but at the same time have not the power to amend them. I, I, I refuse amendments. Why is that, Minister? Private operators got some licences on the basis that they were going through, through some country towns, but when they decided to curtail the stopovers in some of these towns, there was no callback. How can you fair competition with Bus Air in those routes as well? Thank you, Minister. Oh my God. And uh, Chuck to Michael Moynihan. There is two points, right? When a government minister, uh, when there is a dispute and people are on the picket lines, and a government minister comes out, like the uh, Minister for Social Protection did during the week, and said that the uh, bus airing could be done without, I think there is a fundamental issue there in terms of bus airing, which is a company that is primarily servicing rural Ireland and the disregard for the rural population, the citizens of this state who are entitled to public transport, the very same as citizens in any other part in, in Dublin or any other part of the country and I think that you know having leave it left it drift on for all, 12 days and then to come in and give us the line you know and I don't want to put any personalities in it but to give the department a line to say that we're not going to intervene you know I think that there has to be a clear and concise message from government that bus airing is going to remain as a public service company to provide services for rural communities and that all of government irrespective of your ideology, all of government support the survival of this company and the staff that manage. Can I get the to MLD Monster? One minute. Thanks, Cahir. Look, Minister, on April Fool's Day, a pay rise of 5,000 for TDs, um, a rise of €5,000 for TDs kicked in. Um, now, this was a pay rise. It wasn't a pay cut. And at least 90 of those TDs snatched that pay rise with both hands. Now, the bulk of those were government TDs, and those same government TDs think that workers should accept a cut of 30% in their wages. 
They think that that's fair, that bus workers accept a 30% cut in their wages. And those same TDs, Minister, are hiding behind you and backing you at the same time in your attempts to run our public transport network into the ground to suit your agenda of privatisation. Public Transport Minister is a public service, just like education and health, and there are hundreds of thousands of people who depend on it day in, day out. Now, Minister, if those talks at the WRC do not work out, what you're going to have to do, if you persist with your agenda of privatisation, let me tell you here and now, if you persist with this agenda of privatisation and a race to the bottom of workers' rights, oh then you are going to have the mother of all strike, strikes and you and your government will be directly responsible for the chaos that will ensue when that happens. Uh, thanks, uh, Baskin Corla. Well, Minister, uh, you know this speech is in, uh, your, in response. Uh, uh, your speech is incredibly contradictory, um, uh, and you know to, to, to go on washing your hands when you say quite clearly, you say you say that uh, I've intervened to secure increased funding for socially necessary uh, transport, uh, increased funding for free travel. Uh, you're looking at the commercial bus licensing system. Now you, that clearly indicates that you know you have a key role in the future of our public transport system, but the. the the point is, uh, workers and management negotiating, they need to know these facts, and you're the only person who has this information and can kind of give it to them. And you have an awful cheek to talk about productivity. I mean, since 2009-10, uh, when Fianna Fáil and Fine Gael set up the current, set, uh, the current system of bus licensing, which got us into this uh, situation that we're, we're in today, uh, we've had massive increases of productivity by, by, by bus workers, despite uh, in Bus Air and, and Dublin Bus, and indeed in, in Irish Rail. Despite Despite savage cuts in, in pay and indeed in numbers, uh, the workers have been the lifeblood of the public transport system, and you are extremely disrespectful to, to them here tonight. Uh, and Jack Darren Caleri. Mr. Minister, you assumed office on the 6th of May, and you were made very aware of the difficulties facing Bus Erin. You claim credit for securing an extra PSO, but you haven't done anything to deal with the issue of funding within the CIE group, and you have done nothing to explain or understand why bus airing gets a far lower subvention than Dublin bus or Irish Rail. You have done nothing about the employment conditions for workers within bus airing or within the transport industry generally, despite the wish of this House that a sector of employment order be established. You have done nothing uh, in your speech to recognise the damage the strike is doing to regional cities, regional towns right across the country. The towns uh, and cities who are, should be at the core of the retail business are being absolutely decimated. You have done nothing to recognise the fact that to, over 2,000 staff and their families haven't been paid in 12 days because they're fighting for their rights. Minister, it's time you woke up and smelt the coffee here. Whether you smell it in Stepaside or smell it in any part of the country, you are standing by while our transport system is coming to a halt. Get to work. And Chuck uh, Bridge uh, Smith, Bumja Wine. Good morning. Um, I want to completely back up what Deputy Tommy Bruin said. I think you have illustrated in your response to us that you have actually changed your tune and acknowledged that you, as the Minister for Transport, are indeed up to your neck in it. And to say that there is never any ministerial intervention required in industrial disputes is a bit ironic coming from a government who not so long ago, I will remind the House, intervened at the threat of a blue flu by Angarda Siakana and found £40 million to uh, settle that issue and that 40 million was announced by the Minister Pascal Donoghue. So it is wrong to say that Ministers do not intervene, you do indeed intervene. And I'd like to ask you why you think that Gardaí are more important as public servants than bus drivers? Why you think they should have preferential treatment and why you think that they didn't have to go out and strike but that these workers have spent the last 13 days uh, without pay on the picket line and also receiving the brunt of the anger and ire of people who have been discommoded and in some level a, a very unfair description of them as somehow uh, being you know, the, the worst enemies of, of, of this country. Indeed they are not. Could you please answer that question in relation to their role? Minister, in all seriousness, as the Minister of Transport, I would suggest after this discussion you go and meet with the transport workers who actually provide the transport service and they will explain to you how this is a manufactured crisis, a rigged game, 
not a level playing field, and everything has conspired uh, to force uh, this dispute, uh, uh, where they are now s suffering for 12 days on the picket line, but very, very determined that they are not going to be done down to the extent of 30% pay cuts and an assault on our public uh, transport system. And I repeat, and you did not answer me this, uh, Minister, Transport Infrastructure Ireland has revealed that it is €100 million Euro extra that it did not expect to have. That's €100 million Euro that is going a-begging. Now, I am asking you directly, Minister, what would be more appropriate than to spend €100 million additional money that is not a dick, uh, earmarked for anything to spend some of that to resolve a national transport strike which is about the protection of our bus transport infrastructure and ensuring that towns and villages up and down this country have a public service uh, transport infrastructure. Meet with the workers after. Uh, take some money from TII. Colleagues have to be facilitated. Deputy Kenny. Thanks. Let's go on, Carla. Let's go on, Carla. I just want to um, state some facts, and this kind of gets at the hub of this dispute. And the facts are, in Switzerland, uh, the Switzerland uh, Swiss government, sorry, the Belgian government, pays 78% uh, towards public service, PSO, as in Ireland. The other facts, in Switzerland, is 51%. In Holland, it's 49%. And the last place is Ireland, at 12%. So when you have underfunded public service, uh, such as Busserden, you're going to have a crisis. Um, and this crisis is not just for Busserden, but you look at what's going to happen in Dublin Bus over the next year. Uh, Dublin Bus is going to be open to 10% of private operators. The exact same thing is going to happen to bus workers, bus airing workers, as in Dublin Bus workers. This is an, an ideological assault on public transport in Ireland. Um, and it's time you get your finger out. Good. And Chuck uh, Donahue O'Leary. Minister, I put it to you that not only is your policy wrong, wrong in the sense that it is uh, crippling places like Cork, other regional cities in rural Ireland, wrong because it is putting workers in an impossible position, asking them to accept uh, outrageous cuts in pay. But it's not only wrong, but it is monumentally short sighted. It is very short sighted because our cities are becoming more and more clogged up with cars. What we need at this point in time, the right thing to do economically, socially, environmentally, is more investment in public transport. Short-sighted as it is, it is difficult not to uh, conclude that this is uh, not an accident, uh, that this is not on account of laziness, but is, it is arrived at by deliberate government policy. Uh, the Minister seems to be a fan of paper walls between himself and Bus Air and, and between Expressway and the PSO routes. But to compare, uh, for example, a route between Cork and Waterford operating by a private operator and a, by Bus Air that stops in ten places, including small little villages, that's a public service. That's a public service and the Minister needs to recognise that. And only through his intervention can we have the full conversation. And Chuck, uh, Billy Callagher. What we need you to do is to come up quickly with a, a forum where it gives confidence to people that you are actually committed and the government is committed to public transport. There is no doubt about it. Bus Aaron is trying to provide a service with one arm uh, tied behind its back in the context of the unfair competition that is being allowed and afforded to private operators vis-à-vis uh, -vis, uh, Bus Aaron, which are trying to provide a public service obligation. And if you look at the figures and statistics, well, it is quite evident that until such time as there is a level playing pitch where they can compete and where uh, private operators are also obliged to ensure that they have some public service obligations as well. You cannot consistently allow routes to be cherry-picked by the private operators and then wonder why there are difficulties in terms of financial viability in Bus Aaron. Minister, you are the Minister for Transport. We are not asking you to intervene in the industrial relations side of it, but what we are asking you to do is intervene in the transportation side of it to ensure that there is a proper policy in place from you and from this government for public service transport. And finally, Deputy Michael McGrath. Thanks, last game, Corner. Minister, you, you talk about inefficiencies, and the unions have publicly recognised their own responsibilities in that regard. Unions compromise. That's what they do. They enter negotiations and they compromise. And you're right to say 
indicate that any inefficiencies in work practices have to be resolved by negotiation. But you are not fulfilling your own responsibilities. You say, for example, the free travel scheme uh, is being examined. It is almost complete, and I have stated the issue will be resolved satisfact satisfactorily. It is a fact, as we know it, that bus airing is compensated far less than private operators in respect of passengers who use the free travel scheme. That is part of the solution. You have the management of bus air now sta staring down the barrel of examinership, trying to close a deficit. You are sitting on part of the solution and you are saying it is almost complete. Deal with it. That is part of the solution to this problem, Minister. Fifty million for the Gardaí was found. One hundred and twenty million by bringing forward the Lansdowne Road one thousand euro increase was found. We are told through efficiencies. Efficiencies. So where are these inefficiencies that are being, being converted now to efficiencies to make savings of 170 million? It's oh invisible, God. and yet you won't resolve this. And that tells all of us there's something more at play, Minister, and it's an agenda. Two minutes. <coughs> thank you, Concola. And again, like, may I thank the uh, deputies for their contributions. I, I really do get the feeling that uh, the prospect of a resolution of this problem doesn't feel the, fill the deputies' hearts with joy, and that the, some of the things which are said here this afternoon were foolish and were unhelpful to a resolution. I welcome, and I would have expected every deputy here this afternoon to say they welcome the fact that both parties have now got, gone back to the WRC. That is a very healthy development. It's exactly what we've been looking for. And it does offer the only prospect of success. And for deputies to come in here and indulge themselves in condemnations and clichés is not, I think, a very genuine or helpful addition to the debate that's going on outside here. And hopefully will intensify at the, work at the WRC tomorrow. Let me answer a couple of questions that were answered, that were asked. You know, a lot of what the deputies said are, are quite genuine, but they've got to um, accept the bona fides of people who think differently. When Deputy Barry says to me, I'm the most unpopular minister in the country and I'm not very popular in various areas, I have to say this to him. I am not here to be popular. I'm here to make the right decisions. I'm not here to jump on bandwagons or to, make, or to stir or ride on the back of discontent. I'm here to make decisions which I think are in the interest of the taxpayer and the travelling public. That is my job. I understand, because I was there for a long time, where you're coming from fully. But I do not intend to be simply popular by uttering the same sort of clichés as, as I've heard this evening. What, what I would say is this, Deputy, Deputy, Deputy Martin, if you were as accurate with those accusations as you were with what you said today on, on leaders' questions, it would be helpful. You were completely wrong about what you said on Lisa's questions today, you should check your facts before you come into this House and make statements of the sort that you did. Now, I want to answer. I want to. Well, well, I want to answer. I've been very fair, but if you would yeah. concentrate yeah. on. I accept issue. a lot I of. I accept a lot of what people say about about the public transport system, and it is, as Deputy Bruin and Deputy and, and Deputy Smith and others said, it is my business to get involved in a lot of those issues which you mentioned. Of course, it is. But I'll get involved in those, and I've made a public offer, and I make it again to the unions, to the management, to the NTA, and to all stakeholders, that the moment that this particular dispute is over, I will be happy to welcome them to a table to address those issues. That is what I will do. And let me furthermore, and let me furthermore address this, the issue of privatisation. Because the mantra comes through time and time again. Privatisation is not on the agenda. 
And those of you who say it is are deliberately misleading the people up there in the gallery. I have no intention of going down that road, nor will I go down that road. No, nor will I go down that road. Okay. Thank you.